Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for our program, Behind the Scenes of Rail Fan and Railroad Magazine with Steve Barry, editor. Uh, the DC chapter of the National Railway Historical Society presents these free public programs on the third Friday of every month to further our mission to expand the public appreciation of railroads and their history. I'm Scarlett Work, the program coordinator for DC NRHS, and I'm happy you can join us. A few words of introduction to our organization before we get started, for those of you who may not be familiar with our organization. Um, we own and operate a restored 1923 Pullman car, the Dover Harbor, which is Amtrak qualified and goes all over the country with Amtrak. We also have two Amtrak qualified coaches, the Collinsville Inn and Franklin Inn. We have a railroad library that operates out of the Bowie Tower in Bowie, Maryland. And we sponsor rail camp scholarships for young people who are interested in learning more about careers in railroading. And then finally, we publish a monthly newsletter on railroad topics with a lot of great history and photographs, and that's called the timetable. So if you're new to DCRHS, we'd love to have you as a member, and there are links in the chat, or will be, uh, that you can use if you're interested in learning more. So our tradition for the December program is to celebrate winter and holiday railroad themes. Tonight's program will include plenty of those cold weather holiday images that we love. And if you receive our newsletter, you may have noted some holiday recipes as well. Now I can attest to the deliciousness of Wayne Pote's family ERCOT eggnog recipe, and I'll be conducting a mini test kitchen on the locomotive later tonight. Uh, our program, is a behind the scenes look at Rail Fan and Railroad Magazine by its editor, Steve Barry. Mr. Barry's been with Rail Fan and Railroad since 1996 and editor since 1998. He's a prolific photographer and author on all things rail with countless published images and articles and five books, including Railroads, The History of America in 500 Photographs. A lifelong rail fan, Mr. Barry has photographed trains in 49 states and Canada and can be found trackside on any given weekend. He also supports the National Railway Historical Society as a national director and president of the Wilmington chapter. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Steve Barry to our December program. Cheers. Well, thank you. Tonight we're going to be, um, I'll, I'll take you behind, behind the curtain on how we put together a rail fan and railroad magazine in the first part of the show. Uh, then we'll take a little break. If you've got any questions about how we do things at RailFan, I'll be happy to answer those. Just put those in the chat as we go along. And then uh, once we're done that, uh, the second half of the show, I'm going to show some of my favorite uh, Christmas-themed uh, rail photographs, mostly from the East Coast. We're going to go down south a bit, too. But uh, first things first, let's go behind the curtain and see how we do RailFan magazine. And we're going to start off with a little introduction here. Um, RailFan and Railroad, we're produced by White River Productions, and we're... Um, Based, well, I'm based in um, Swedesboro, New Jersey. Anyhow, we are a monthly magazine. We cover all aspects of, uh, of railroading. Our bread and butter is contemporary stuff, uh, short lines, interesting pieces of mainline track, things like that. But we also cover some historical topics. We do steam diesel traction and primarily focused on the, um, on the U.S. and Canada. However, we do also... Uh, occasionally cover some foreign topics as well. As I said, we are produced by White River Productions. They are now the largest publisher of railroad themed content in the United States. We have all these commercial magazines that we're doing, including Railroad Model Craftsman, uh, Model Railroad News, Passenger Train Journal, uh, Trains and Railroads of the Past, HO Collector, O Scale Trains, uh, the Narrow Gauge Gazette and our Railroads Illustrated Annual. And since this slide was made up, we have also added Rail Pace, a news magazine to the roster and Diesel Era as well. So we, uh, so we have all those magazines. Uh, we also publish about 25 or thereabouts magazines on behalf of historical societies who are responsible for the content. We do the editing of the content and put the magazines together for them. We also have a uh, books division and if I may say so myself, our book sell um, department does, does a bang-up job. Some of these books are just beyond awesome. Uh, the color reproduction is always great. Um, if you ever uh, buy a White River book, uh, rest assured, uh, it's going to be of the highest quality. Between the books and the magazines and the calendars we produce 
and uh, for uh, for historical societies plus our own. Um, our boss, Kevin Udaly, our publisher, estimates we put out a new product once every 1.3 days of something. So it's quite a bit. Now, uh, let's meet the staff of Railfan and Railroad. And to do that, we got to take a cross-country trip. We're going to start off where I am on the far right side there in beautiful Swedesboro, New Jersey. My associate editor, or actually managing editor now, Otto Vondrak, well, he's up in Rochester, New York. Continuing across the country, we come to Buckland, Missouri. That's our home office. That's where publisher Kevin Udaly lives when he's not on his horse ranch down in Texas. And that's where all of our uh, business offices are located, subscriptions and things like that. From there, we head further west up to Whitefish, Montana. That's where associate editor Justin Franz lives. And then finally, we wind up in Medford, Oregon, and that's where we have Mike Lindsay and the advertising department. So we are definitely not centralized. Uh, each of the magazines is produced out of an independent office somewhere in the United States, all across the country. Certainly not, uh, not in one location at all. We do try to see the boss once a year doesn't always work out that way, um, especially with COVID. The boss will sometimes have a uh, get together out in Missouri for everybody to come out and, uh, and mingle. And of course, um, while we're out there, we have a business meeting. Of course, the business meeting for RailFed, anyhow, consists of uh, me and Otto and Justin going out for a day of rail fanning with the boss. So mostly he's taking pictures with a little bit of, of discussion of business in the process. So how do we get started? Well, um, our magazine is done almost entirely by freelancers. And the freelancers will write their features, get, gather their photos, and upload them to our FTP portal. Back in the old days, when I first started off with the magazine in 1996, we probably handled about 200 slides per month. Today, if we handle 60 slides a year, that's a lot. Um, everything comes in digitally. Uh, via the FTP portal, um, even folks whose uh, source material is slides uh, will have those scanned and upload those to the FTP portal. And for a brief time, a lot of the stuff came in via CD, but that's no longer the case. It's all uploaded now. In fact, my computer doesn't even have a CD drive anymore. So we start off uh, in our software. It's, it's in design by Adobe. And this is our template, and we see have our basics here, our, our clever subhead, uh, our title, uh, the byline, and we have some um, Latin text with our proper uh, font for our basic, um, basic design laid in here. So the first thing we do is we get the, the text document off the FTP server that our author is sent in, and we dump in all the text, it's raw text. Otto and Justin and I, we used to take a, a turn at it, um, Looking, looking over, doing some smoothing out, stuff like that. Once that's done, that goes off to our proofreading staff. And they're, they're, they're mostly out in Kansas City. Once we uh, have the text in, then Otto gets busy on design. And we drop in, um, he drops in the photos, designs the headlines, puts in the author. Um, you may be able to see it on your screen here. Uh, at this point, we still don't have the captions. And the captions on the right-hand side there are still all in the Latin waiting for the author to get back to us. Once you make the photo selection, the author uh, looks it over, makes sure our photo selection is good, and then writes the captions for each of the features. We also design the uh, cover, Otto, Otto does that up in Rochester. Um, this is a sneak peek at the magazine we're working on right now, the February issue. Um, we're still working on it, so as you can see, we have the uh, Pan Am headline on there, the cut line for it below that. We don't have the page number yet because we haven't gotten far enough in the process yet to know exactly which page this is going to wind up on. We do work on only one magazine at a time. Um, unlike uh, bigger publishers who have magazines stretched out over a few months in different stages of, pro of progress, uh, we work on one, finish it, and then turn our attention to the next one. Features that need it all get maps, and those are also uh, – part of what Otto does up in Rochester. All the maps we, we use are done in-house by Otto. 
and we drop those into the features. We also have some advertising, what we call our mixed pages. That's mixed editorial and advertising. I handle that. I get the list of ads from, uh, from Mike Lindsay out in Oregon. Uh, he sends me the list of ads and the sizes, and I make room in the mix pages, and then I place the ads where, where, wherever they'll fit. Some months are tighter than others. Some months are loose, we, we, uh, but it, it varies. But we, we get them all in there. Um, money is good. Our rail news section is put together uh, by Justin out in Whitefish. Justin uh, gathers in the news from uh, a handful of uh, our news columnists. Uh, we have different columnists for different uh, railroads. Uh, as you can see here on this page here, we have BNSF on the far left. Eric Berger is our news columnist for BNSF. In the middle of the right-hand page, we have Canadian National. David Stowe does that. Uh, we also have not, uh, the, we have the uh, six of the seven class ones, Kansas City, Southern, uh, doesn't generate enough news for its own section, but every, the other six do. Uh, we also have a short line column and a preservation news column in this section. This is the last thing we do because we want to make sure the news section is as fresh as it can be uh, when we send it off to the printer. So we have all of that. Our next step is to make PDFs, and we make PDFs of each individual page. As you can see here on this uh, slide, um, almost dead center, I'm working on page number 63, it says there. I'm, I'm uploading page 63 to the printer. And I'll do this for every page from 1 through uh, 84. We have 84 pages uh, each month. So we send all the pages individually up to the printer, which is um, Quad Graphics in West Allis, Wisconsin, a suburb of Milwaukee. And we look at our screen and we have our pages here. Uh, this is last month's issue, which is already out the door and is actually in the mail right now. So you see the green checks where I've approved it already. Uh, normally, um, those checks wouldn't be there until the approvals are done on the last day of, of production. Once everything is uploaded to the printer, we go into what is called uh, Insight, produced by Kodak. Uh, this, these are our proofs. No more paper proofs. It's all electronic now. And this is our last look at each page before it goes on press. Uh, down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a green bar there. That's because I've approved this. This is, um, this is last month's cover. I've approved this page. Uh, before approval, that green bar down bottom there would actually be a choice of either uh, accept the page or uh, reject the page. So off it goes to the printer. Um, they put it on press. And about two and a half weeks later, it shows up in your mailbox or out in the hobby shop. And that's a little bit of how we put things together. Um, is there anything in the chat that we, uh, any questions anybody has? Yes. Um, you get inputs from all over the country. John yes. Eldridge is wondering, how did you put it all together before the internet with the mail and how oh, about yeah. the deadlines? The, the deadlines weren't any further out back then, but yes, it all came in through the mail. Um, back in the slide days, when I first started there, all slides got sent out for um, four color separation on drum scanners. Uh, that eventually moved in-house. We were scanning the slides uh, on, on scanners actually in the office. Um, some of the text came in as a Word document. Some of it came in as typewritten pages, and we had to just simply uh, transcribe it into the computer. Um, so that's the old way of doing it. Uh, they were doing cut and paste before I got there. I started in 96. Uh, I think cut and paste, we're sending the type out for um, the type out for typesetting and getting the galleys back. All of that ended probably around 93. All right. Uh, Ed has a question. Is there anything that separates White River Productions in any way from Combat Publishing? Um, wow. Um, other than we do more magazines, put out more content. Um, they have a bigger staff than us. Um, and thus, they are probably working on magazines two or three months in advance, whereas we are not. We're working on them one at a time. Uh, and they are also still, um, they still have a central office up in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Uh, unlike us who are scattered all over the place. Um, other than that, 
not much different, uh, different. Um, we're competitors, but we're friendly competitors. We, we compete mostly in for advertisers, um, but go to a major railroad event, convention, things like that. And you'll find the staffs of the two magazines uh, hanging out together, shooting together. Uh, we're, 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 we're friendly out in the field. No problem with that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, but uh, there will be time later if you think of other things. So carry on. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to look at some uh, slides here now. And by slides, I mean original digital images for the most part. So a couple of scant slides and at the end. Uh, we're going to go and do some Christmas theme stuff here. Uh, one of the neat phenomena of the recent years is railroads have caught on that Polar Express is a huge, huge, huge moneymaker. And that means they run trains at night a lot. And that has opened up a whole lot of new photo possibilities, especially for steam at night. So um, I've been getting out in recent years with my flash gear and lighting things up. We're going to start off here. This is a Christmas train. You can see the decorations on the locomotive. This is a Christmas train on the Northern Central, uh, formerly Steam in the History. That's their brand new 1860s 440 there coming through the uh, tastefully named town of Railroad, Pennsylvania. Uh, sticking with Pennsylvania, we're on the New Hope and Ivy Land up in New Hope, Pennsylvania, a little lo location called Hood. That's their uh, consolidation, 280 number 40. And Hood's a cool place to shoot. There's a lot of neat buildings and things like that around there. This is another view um, at Hood. Uh, the bridge you just saw in the last shot is just ahead of the locomotive here. And another view at Hood. Moving over to New Jersey, just across the river from New Hope, we're on the Black River and Western here, another uh, 280, uh, X Great Western number 60. This is approaching Ringo's, New Jersey. And crossing over uh, Copper Hill uh, Viaduct, just outside of Flemington. Uh, for this shot here, um, I have my flashes all set up. And whenever I have my flashes set up, the train's off in the distance. Um, when you can first see where I'm located, I'll fire a couple of flashes so they can see the flashes down the tracks. That way they, they, know, they know I'm there. Um, the flashes are more surprising than they are bright. Um, well, I, I fired my, my heads up flash to the crew here. Immediately, I heard, I heard a whistle back. They just whistled back, acknowledging the flash. Then I heard them back off on the throttle. And as they got to the bridge, they opened it up and produced the smoke for the shot. That was kind of cool of them. Over in Delaware, just, just across the river from where I'm sitting right now is the Wilmington and Western. And what they were doing was they were taking their ex-Pennsylvania Railroad doodle bug and putting 10,000 lights on it. So here you see the doodle bug at the railroad's Green Bank Station ready to go. They made quite a sight rolling through the woods, all decorated out. Well, alas, one year the doodle bug broke down. And they had to break out their diesel and three coaches. Well, they discovered that they could sell three coaches just as easy as they could sell one doodle bug. And they made a whole lot more revenue. So the poor doodle bug was put away for Christmas trains and they started using uh, a diesel powered train with three or four coaches, generator car behind the locomotive here, all decked out in lights, one end to the other. This is approaching the Falkland Woods station, um, which is not an original station. It's actually a scaled down version of a Baltimore and Ohio station that somebody built in their backyard right next to the railroad. And here you see the, um, the train with the caboose trail in it crossing over um, Lancaster Pike in suburban Wilmington. And then once or twice a year, they'll break out the steam engine and put it on the front of the train. Here's their 060, ready to depart Green Bank one night. And coming through the... Uh, Iron Trust Bridge at Ashland, Delaware. But for me, my favorite place is probably the Strasburg Railroad in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. There will be times when they'll run two or three or four steam trains after dark, and I'll go and set the lights and shoot them. Here we see their 210 number 90 
coming back from Lemon Place Junction, approaching the Pumpkinville Turnpike Bridge. Here we see their Canadian National 260, number 89, crossing over Pumpkinville Turnpike. Neat thing about night photography, these things that you don't see in the daytime show off. Do you see the, the fire coming out underneath of uh, the running boards there on 89 out of the firebox? Here's um, their uh, 480, number 475, next Norfolk and Western, approaching the uh, cemetery at Carpenter's Crossing. And here we are uh, in the cemetery. This is a shot that this isn't quite perfect. Um, there's still some ways I would tweak it, but it's a hard shot to, to, to light up because there's just so much acreage to, to, to light up here. I will get this one of these days. I'll get it right. And here's number 90 at the uh, online picnic grove at Groff's Grove. But changing gears here, for me, the, uh, the coolest thing, the way I kick off my Christmas usually in the past, I won't say usually, often, is I would head down to Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia every year the weekend before Thanksgiving. That is when CSX and prior to it, the Clinchfield Railroad runs its Santa trains. The first Santa train ran in 1943, and it was mostly to um, distribute gifts online to some of the uh, some of the uh, underprivileged areas in um, in the Appalachians. As this map here shows, the train starts off up in Shelbyana, Kentucky, uh, goes through Maribone. These are all each of these towns is where the train stops and they throw gifts off the back to, to the waiting crowd. Uh, at least Shelbyana at about. 6.30 in the morning. So the Shelby Anna shot uh, uh, stop and the Marrowbone stop are uh, both in early morning darkness. Uh, by Elkhorn City, it's starting to get light in the sky. And then the train goes through, uh, breaks Interstate Park and crosses over into Virginia at that point and goes to Tom's Bottom and Hayside. By Hayside, it's getting light. Clinch goes the first place to see any kind of decent light. Down through Fremont, uh, even though it says Dante, that's Dant, Virginia. St. Paul, Virginia is by far and away the biggest stop on the line. Then Dungannon, Fort Blackmore. At Fort Blackmore, the tracks go across Copper Creek Viaduct and into a tunnel. All the roads go around the mountain. So if you get it at Copper Creek Viaduct, which I usually do, uh, usually miss the stops at Kermit and Waycross, but you can catch up to the train where it terminates at Kingsport. Gets to Kingsport at about three in the afternoon. It used to be timed to be in time for the uh, Christmas parade in Kingsport, but in the last several years, they have moved the parade to a different day. So my first time chasing the Santa train was in 1992. That was the 50th anniversary of the Santa train. And um, I'm not going to start with that. I'm going to get back to that a little bit later on. From 1992 to 2010, I did not see the Santa train. Uh, but then in 2010, uh, I went back down and um, decided to, to chase it. So here we are in Hayside, Virginia. Uh, Santa on the back of the train as they throw gifts off to the waiting crowd. Shortly after getting this shot here, I sustained my only injury shooting the Santa train. I was looking down at my camera, changing the camera settings. And Santa Claus hit me in the eye with a pop tart. Uh, so you got to pay attention when you're out here with all these things flying around. This is at Clinchco. This is where the sun first gets up over the mountains for the most part. And CSX and before at Clinchfield, they really did this right. In addition to throwing all these toys off the back of the train, there's an army of volunteers on the ground carrying bags and bags of gifts. And they make sure every kid in the crowd has a present. I think Santa used to be an NFL quarterback because sometimes he would um, spot a kid in the crowd, would point to the kid, and then fire a perfect strike uh, with, with a pass of a toy to the kid. Here's the front end of the Santa train. CSX uh, freight motors pulling uh, the CSX business train. The Santa train usually has a musical guest riding along. And in 2010, the guests were the Judds, Naomi and Winona Judd. It's Winona throwing gifts off the back. And her mother, Naomi. 
This is coming through Osborne's Curve, just above Dungannon, Virginia. A favorite spot for photographers. You'll see a few shots in this of, of Osborne's Curve. And this is uh, stopping at Fort Blackmore. There's a convenient overpass right next to the Santa stop. And you see the line of cars extending up the road there to the left. People have come down to the tracks to, to see Santa. Uh, you'll notice that CSX has one of their business train F40s as a second unit. Until recently, they didn't use an F40 on the front, as the front unit on the train. They used a, a typical narrow nose freight motor uh, for visibility. So the crew could see down along the side of the engine better uh, approaching the crowds. And this is Copper Creek Viaduct near Spears Ferry, Virginia. I didn't get back down there again until 2014. And here we are at Hayside again with the 2014 train. You see the number of toys coming off the back here. Literally tons of toys, uh, all uh, donated uh, by Food City, the, the supermarket chain down there. And this is at Hayside. This is one of the smaller crowds. Hayside is a small stop. Uh, the crowds are, are usually much larger than this at each of the stops. Where the guy is standing over on the right-hand side of the, with the orange, uh, orange pullover hat, that's where I was standing when I had my Pop-Tart incident a few years before. Coming out of Clinchport, Santa Claus riding the observation car, or Clinchco, rather. This was a big coal mining area down here. Um, coal is drying up. Traffic is down. That's going to come into play here in a, in a few minutes. This is one of the loadouts along the old clinch field. At Dant is one of the classic clinch field photo props, the Union Baptist Church right up against the tracks. The locomotive you see on the front here is a modified SD40. Um, CSX rebuilt it. it. They kind of chopped the cab down so it's uh, square. Uh, these naturally have thus earned the nickname of SpongeBob Square Cab. Uh, there's even a song about it now, which I'm not going to sing. Coming out of Dan, here's uh, the Santa train heading south. And back in St. Paul. And once again, the obligatory Fort Blackmore shot. And once again, you can see the crowd here gathered around the back. This was 2014. I wasn't planning on going back down to the clinch field again until 2016. However, mid-year 2015, CSX embargoed the entire clinch field. Uh, coal traffic was down. They didn't need it anymore. They did announce, though, that the Santa train would run in 2015. So figuring that might be the last chance I would be able to chase the Santa train, I went back down there in 2015. Now, the problem was I had already agreed to do a program for the Lancaster chapter NRHS on Friday night before the train ran on Saturday morning in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So I finished my program in Lancaster, hopped in the car, drove straight through to Elkhorn City, Kentucky, the Brakes Interstate Park, and arrived at Pool Point uh, in Brakes Interstate Park about 20 minutes before the train got there. A lot of people, a lot of rail fans go down there and chase the train, but only shoot the locomotives. I always made sure to get to the back of the train each time and shoot the uh, where all the fun is at the back where Santa and the kids and everything. Here we are back at the Union Baptist Church in Damp.
really an incredible thing. And I, I, this is always a perfect way to start off the Christmas season for me. Uh, Fort Blackmore, cloudy day, so I shot from the other side of the train. And then uh, crossing Copper Creek, uh, Clinchfield overhead, uh, ex Southern Railway down below here that I'm standing on. Part of Norfolk Southern now. Um, from there, like I said, the train goes through the mountain, the roads go around the mountain, so I didn't catch up with the train again until it was crossing over the Holston River approaching uh, Knoxville. Well, lo and behold, uh, traffic picked up again, uh, and the Clinchfield was reopened. So that meant that uh, I was back down there again in 2017. Now, I'll get back to 2017. That was the uh, 75th anniversary. We'll come back to that. Um, we'll skip ahead to 2019, which was the last year the train ran. It didn't run at all in 2020 or 2021 because of COVID. Uh, here we see the train just before um, sunrise coming into um, Elkhorn City, Kentucky. And by now, they've uh, lifted their ban on the F-40s leading the train. And you see one of the uh, uh, business train F-40s on the point here. This was the first year I had a chance to actually ride the train. Here I'm on the, on the back of the train at the stop at uh, Hayside. And the reason I was riding the train was because a friend of mine was actually, is actually in the band that was the musical guest in 2019. Coming out of... Um, Clinchco. And once again, you got to do the shot at the Union Baptist Church in Damp. The musical guest that year was Marty Stewart and his fabulous superlatives. And there's Marty on the back ready to toss a toy off. That's uh, Marty's bass player, one of the superlatives. That's Professor Chris Scruggs. And his guitar picker, a cousin Kenny Vaughn. My friend is the drummer in the band, Harry Stinson. Unfortunately, Harry's mother passed away two days before the train ran, and he couldn't make the trip. If you watch the uh, Ken Burns um, country music series, um, Marty Stewart was the... Uh, one of the primary storytellers in that. Marty spotted me in the crowd and gave me a, gave me a little sign there. And here we are coming into Dungannon. It wasn't the best weather day, that's for sure. And crossing over Copper Creek. And arriving in Kingsport is Marty getting off the train. So that was the last year the train ran. Now let's go back two years to 2017 to the 75th anniversary of the Santa train. For this, CSX pulled out all the stops. To power the train, they procured uh, a former Clinchfield F unit out of the Southern Appalachia Railway Museum in um, Oak Ridge, Tennessee and got it ready for road service and used it on the head end of the Santa train. Uh, two days before the train ran, they had a media day organized by a CSX vice president who was actually quite a rail fan. And so it turned more into like a, like a, a rail fan day. This is the shortest tunnel on the Clinchfield, Holston Tunnel, about 100 feet long, uh, just south of Kingsport. We brought the F unit out here um, for photos. Assisting the F unit was this um, SD-45, also from the Southern Appalachia Railway Museum, a letter for the Clinchfield. Um, back in the day, back in uh, the, the Clinchfield purchased a handful of SD-45s from the seaboard, painted in basic seaboard black. Clinchfield took what the, the engines they just purchased, the secondhand engines, added Clinchfield lettering, put the typical Clinchfield yellow number boards into them, 
and used them for many years on the clinch field. Uh, the 3632 was not one of those XC board engines that the clinch field acquired. It is an XC board locomotive, and it could have been one the clinch field would have acquired, but this is what it would have looked like had it been part of that sale. Uh, 3632 is one number higher than the last of the actual clinch field secondhand engines. Here we are in Kingsport. Um, getting ready to go north for the Santa train. Uh, the, the train deadheads from Spartanburg, South Carolina, up to Kingsport, and then from there up to uh, Shelby Anna to pull the, um, the Santa train. That's the Eastman plant in the background there in Kingsport. So the next day, the day before the Santa train ran, uh, the train had to go north. And once again, our, our, our friendly CSX vice president turned this into one big photo opportunity. Uh, we started off before sunrise at Copper Creek Bridge with the SD-45 leading. Uh, we stopped at the Twin Tunnels, posed the train there for some shots. And I'm a huge Clinchfield fan. I, I love the Clinchfield, but almost never saw it in regular service. This was like heaven for me. This was like a dream come true. I still pinch myself that this actually happened. going north into uh, Clinchgo. And then uh, we paused at um, Pool Point in, in Brakes Inter Inter uh, Interstate Park for some photos as well. So the engines ran around the train, got on the other end, and got ready to go the next day on the Santa train, now with the 800 leading. And off we go. Once again, we're in Elkhorn City just before sunrise as the train comes in. Uh, the two historic engines on the point, the CSX business train F40s trailing behind them. Uh, coming out of the tunnel just north of Clinchco. Like I said, as a Clinchfield fan, I couldn't believe I was seeing this. This is just incredible. The musical guest that year was Ricky Staggs, the country music and bluegrass uh, musician. That's Ricky on the far right in the blue coat there. He was taking pictures of the rail fans, taking pictures of him. Once again, we're coming out of Clinchco here. And of course, you got to do Dant. So there's the Union Baptist Church in Dant. and Fort Blackmore. Now, the train got into Kingsport. They unloaded all the, um, all the stuff they needed to unload. It had to deadhead down to Spartanburg, South Carolina that night. And there is a classic, classic shot on the clinch field uh, down below Kingsport at the Tow River Baptist Church in Huntsdale, South Carolina. I really wanted to get a shot of the F unit going past the church there. I was going to take my lights down there, set them up and shoot the train as it went by. Well, unfortunately, uh, CSX decided that the F-40s had to lead the train going south down to Spartanburg. However, our friendly CSX vice president said, wait a minute. He says, I think I can get you the Huntdale shot. So about 30 of us wound up down in the Huntdale that night. And the F-40s pulled up and they stopped and we got shots of them with the uh, Baptist Church in the background. That is not snow, that's rain coming down. And then once we we're done with this, the F-40s pulled up a little bit, cut off the, uh, the train, and we got our shot with the F unit going by the church. This is, like I said, just a, the cherry on top of the Sunday for, for this trip. It's incredible. Okay, so... We're going to flash back one more time. Let's go back to my first Santa chase back in 1992. That was the 50th anniversary of the Santa train. And for that, once again, CSX pulled out all the stops. The Clinchfield had Challenger locomotives. All of them have since been scrapped. However, Union Pacific had an active Challenger on its roster for excursions. The 3985. And CSX somehow talked Union Pacific into sending the Challenger East to pull the 50th anniversary of the Santa train. 
So here we see our Clinchfield challenger, numbered 676, which is one number higher than Clinchfield's actual challengers. And this was incredible. This is, once again, this is just unbelievable. Gloomy, gloomy, gloomy day, and I was shooting on Kodachrome 200, and even that was a little bit, not quite uh, fast enough to capture some of this stuff. Just a dark day. Here you see the train coming out of the tunnel in Joaquinva, Virginia. And going through the S-curves at a location known as Booty, uh, Virginia. And we're back at uh, Osborne's curve at Dungannon. You've seen a couple of shots here with diesels before. Crossing over a bridge that still has Clinchfield Railroad uh, painted on the side. And they posed the train on Copper Creek Viaduct for a few shots. Uh, this is coming uh, off of Copper Creek, a uh, couple of miles away, Spears Ferry. Train stomping through the mist. And finally, arrival at Kingsport. So that's my experience with the Santa train. That is, uh, like I said, that is. The kids get their gifts down here and everything. It was this is what Christmas is all about. Uh, and like I said, it's the perfect start for me for the Christmas season. Unfortunately, with the two cancellations the past two years, no one's really sure if the Santa train's ever going to come back again. It'd be a shame if it didn't. Um, but um, if it's back in 2022, I know where I will be the weekend before Thanksgiving next year. So with that, uh, I am going to wrap things up. Wish you all a Merry Christmas, and we shall uh, get to some questions here. Okay. Um, I have a question from Ann about photo shoots. Uh, when you're planning these shoots, does the engineer know that you're there in advance? Do you tell the railroad that you're shooting? No. Uh, usually there's no way to communicate that to the train crew. Like I said, uh, as the train gets into sight, um, I will fire... Um, a couple of heads up flashes. They'll see the flashes down the track if they're paying attention. And, and, um, and light photography now of, of moving trains has gotten so, so prevalent that most train crews now know what that means. So they're, they're ready for it. Um, I've had um, train crews. Uh, I, I was shooting a Norfolk Southern train in Virginia one time, then it sh shot the heads up flash. Immediately, I heard two toots back on the horn. The engineer knows what's going on. And then the train goes by. I fire the flashes, look at the picture. And the engineer's hanging way out of the window, waving to us. Oh, uh, other times, um, I was down on the, uh, on, the Norfolk, on, on the old Norfolk and Western uh, on the Pocahontas District in uh, West Virginia. And I was actually a train was going away. We had helpers in the back of it. And... Um, even there was helpers, the, it's, it's, they're manned helpers. I know the engineer would be in there uh, looking at his rear view mirror, which would be because he would be facing the way the train was, was coming from. Uh, but I, I, I fired a heads up flash for him. Well, he wound up turning on his ditch lights and headlights and leaning out of the cab. So it looked like the train was coming at us. So, yeah, so um, th they, they know what's going on but for the most part. Um, so if they're paying attention, uh, they'll. Um, I'll, I'll fire enough flashes in advance that they know it's not just a one-time thing. They'll, they'll figure it out. All right. Thank you. Um, Daryl would like to know, um, the, the Santa train had some pretty long consists. Who mm -hmm. populates the train? Who's on the train? Uh, yes. <laughs> CSX officials for the most part, uh, local officials, um, no general public. Um, but the first four or five cars at the rear of the train, are just wall-to-wall -wall boxes of toys and presents and wrapping paper and everything else. Uh, there's tons of stuff, and there's a human conveyor belt 
constantly shuffling full boxes to the back of the train and empty boxes up to the front of the train. Okay. Um, from Ann, since you've shot multiple Santa trains many times, have you ever done a photo collage of all the various engines at similar locations? I have not. Uh, I haven't. I don't think I've shot all of the tra- all, all the trains at the same location every year. I think there, there's gaps uh, of, of, uh, among locations as you go through the years. I, I try to vary things up. Um, Dant would be the closest, but I didn't get the steam train at Dant at, at the church, and I didn't get the 2010 train at Dant. All right. I'm not seeing other questions. Have I missed any? All right. John Cowgill suggests that we do a photo shoot with the DC and RHS. I'm not sure if you're thinking <laughs> Santa Train or, or what, but we can follow up on that. There are no photo shoots to be had. Done. All right. We have any further questions for Steve? Okay. Well, Steve, I want to thank you for a great program. Uh, those images are like nothing I've ever seen. What a great uh, way to go into the rest of the holiday season. That's thank you. breathtaking. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of those places look kind of close to home to me. <laughs> um, so thank you again for making the time to be with us tonight and for sharing your work with us. Hey, um, you're welcome. So... I just want to remind everybody that our uh, programs are available on YouTube. So if you really love these photos, you'll be able to see them um, in a couple of weeks um, in, in a YouTube recording. And if you've missed any, like I have this summer, they're all out there on the DC and RHS YouTube channel. So uh, avail yourself of that. So um, I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. It's great to see everybody. And as always, Thanks not only to Steve, but to the folks behind the scenes who make these programs happen and make them available electronically to us tonight and later, and and Gary Goldsmith. So in closing, if you have any feedback or suggestions for future programs, we are uh, very welcoming of that. And you can email us at programs at dcnrhs.org. Good night, everybody. Good night. And Merry Christmas. And Happy Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas to y'all, too.